Hi, I'm Doug Goldstein with Profile Investment Services. If you have a brokerage account or an IRA account, it's most likely that every month you get a statement. It's either mailed to you or if you've signed up for online, then you get it online or maybe even both. The question arises, what do I need to look at in the statement? So frankly, the official answer is you've got to look at everything to know what's going on. But I'd like to teach you a few of the important points to look at, especially if you don't have time to do an in-depth review. Everyone should look at his brokerage account at least once a month. And if there's more activity in the account, or if you have a debit card or a checkbook attached to the account, you should check maybe even a little more frequently just to make sure that there's no fraudulent use of those. But I put together a little presentation, so stay with me now. I'm gonna jump to the other side of the computer and I'm gonna show you exactly what I think you should be looking at when you open your brokerage statement. So what are the most important things to look at in a statement? I'm gonna use the Pershing statement as the example. The fact is many brokerage firms have very similar looking statements. So if you don't have exactly this, you'll probably see something very similar. This is what a statement generally looks like. You can see I've blackened out the, the real name and the uh, account number of the client but the, the principle here remains the same, what you can look at. So let me just point out a few things right at the outset. We'll zoom in over here. In the upper left corner, it says Portfolio Resources International Group. That is the broker dealer that oversees the account. It oversees the, the advisors and the brokers. It also is the one who's responsible for, for overseeing the activity in the account that you do. So that's why their name is on the statement. And in fact, you are a client of Portfolio Resources International Group. Then, if you go to the lower right side of the page, you'll see that it says Clearing Through Pershing LLC, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Bank of New York Mellon Corporation, BNY Mellon. Pershing LLC is a member of FINRA, New York Stock Exchange, and the SIPC. This information is to let you know where the actual assets are being custodied. There's really two halves to handling your money. One of them is the advisory side, which is what is done through my office and through Portfolio Resources Group. And then there's the, the custody or custody and clearing, we call it. They're the ones who actually execute the trades. They print the statements. They hold the, the securities. They're the, the big name behind it. That's where your money actually is being held. Okay, let's go back to the statement and let's look here in the upper right corner, the valuation at a glance. I actually think this is a very useful square for people who are in a hurry. Let's zoom in on that too. You can see it's showing you at the beginning of the period. The statement period here is February 1st until February 28th of the year 2015. So at the beginning of the period, meaning on February 1st, the value of the account was about 1.150 million, 1 million 150,000, a little more than that. And the ending account value, the part that's blackened in there, it was worth 1 million 158,000 dollars, plus a little bit more. So it gives you, if nothing else, a sense of what's going on in the value of the account, and I think that is certainly very important. It also shows you how much you received in dividends and interest this month, which was about $2,400, and it shows you the change in the account value, which means the value of the actual securities that might have gone up and down. And below the big black line, it says estimated annual income $41,000. Now this is a very critical number and quite frankly, sometimes people get a little confused about what, what it's all about, so let me tell you. There are three ways that you make money in investing. Either you have capital gains, which means you buy something and you sell it for more, or you receive interest, like you would get interest from a bond or a bank deposit, or you receive dividends. Dividends usually come from stocks or mutual funds. It's all money that you're making, but they, they do have different names. Of those three, one of them is so unpredictable that no one's willing to put in writing what he thinks is gonna happen. And that I'm talking about capital gains. No one has any idea whether the stock market's gonna go up or down. So they're not gonna write it down. They're not gonna tell you. However, the dividends and the interest payments, we do have a pretty good sense. We can estimate what they're gonna be. If you hold on to the securities you have in the account, we can estimate how much income you'll get. So in this case, the portfolios estimated to earn about $41,000 a year in dividends and interest. Okay, let's go to the next page now. So here we are, we're back at the front page. The next section I wanna show you is the area that says asset allocation. Also very important, and so let's zoom in here. 
Over here, you can see it's showing you cash, money funds, and bank deposits. Those are often called cash equivalents. They're the, the safe stuff in the account, the, the stuff, in at least the, the uh, money markets that we use are insured by the FDIC. So in this case, the client has about 3% of his money in cash, $31,000. Fixed income, which is usually referring to bonds, is about 36% of the value of the account. Equities, which are stocks, is about 11% of the value of the account. Mutual funds represent about 28% of the value of the account. Now, mutual funds may invest in many, many different types of investments. You could have stock funds or bond funds or balanced funds. There are lots of different types of funds. So it's not clear just from looking at this exactly how much risk is in the portfolio because he might have mutual funds that are very, very safe that invest in, in very, very safe things, or he might have mutual funds that are very aggressive. And the next line is exchange traded products. Exchange traded products are similar in many ways to mutual funds, except they trade on an exchange. There are other differences as well. It's not the time to, in this discussion, to talk about the differences between mutual funds and exchange traded products. But I want to show you here that you, they are delineated on the statement and you can see how much you have in each one. And it also shows you very conveniently as a pie chart. One of the things I'll tell clients all the time is when you get your statement and you look at the front page, if you have a huge amount in cash, more than you think you want to have, you should give me a call. Why would you have so much in cash? Well, maybe you made a deposit. Maybe one of your bonds matured and now all the that cash has built up in the account and it's time to invest it. It's up to you because you're the one who has to look at your statements on a regular basis to give us a call and let us know what you want to do. Now it's true that as an advisor I keep an eye on what's going on but I certainly don't look at everyone's statement every day and things might happen and you should be checking in. Every person is ultimately responsible for his own brokerage account. Going on to the next page. Here you get some basic information. Of course, there's contact information for us and for the U.S. brokerage firm, the office in Miami. It also tells you information that would be useful for your accountant. Like you can see in the middle there, it says your account information, and it says tax lot default disposition method. I'm not going to go into the details here. This is relevant for accountants. Also further down, it tells you just at the very bottom, it says distributions, long-term capital gain distributions, short-term capital gain distributions. And on the right side, it shows you $825 a year. Well, that was how much you received in capital gain distributions. And just go up a little bit and you'll see the $5,697. That's how much was received in dividends and interest minus income and expenses. So that information is very useful in making tax decisions. So sometimes we'll look at that and you can keep an eye on that to see what sort of tax bill you might expect based on the income you have for the year. Going on to the next page, you can see, let's take a look at the right side where it says fees. We're under the debits column and it says fees minus $1,419. That's what the client has paid year to date. So that's something that you might certainly want to keep an eye on. On the left side, of there's, we're looking at credits and it says dividends and interest. If you see the third line down, shows you that this period, meaning this month, the client earned about $2,500 in dividends and interest. Year to date, about $5,800. Distributions could have to do with, that's the line right below that, would normally be something like a distribution from a bond. These are some of the, the big picture issues. We're looking at kind of a summary page. In fact, it's called activity summary. When you want to drill down, you go further down in the statement. And I want to just note, I, I added those words in red. Securities listed here are not investment recommendations. I'm just showing you it, basically a random statement. So the fact that you see it here does not mean you should run out and buy it. Always speak to your financial advisor to discuss your own investment strategies. But here you can see everything's listed by date. When a dividend came in on February 2nd, it was reinvested. If you go down a little bit further to February 13th, you can see the client purchased 80 shares of Apple Computer. And right below that, he also purchased 300 shares of Intel. And he also purchased uh, SPY, the, which is the S&P 500 fund. This is just information that he can see to make sure he knows what happened in his account. On the right side, those show up as negatives because it was a cost to him. It was a negative cash flow to buy those securities. 
Okay, let's move on. Lots more transactions by, uh, that, that you can see here. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but you should take a look. Things you might want to look for is anything that's very strange. If you see a large addition or, or withdrawal from your account that you don't understand, look closely, and if you still don't understand it, call your advisor. If, for example, there's fraud or someone's using your account, you need to report it right away. You get further down, here we're looking at the portfolio holdings. This is under fixed income. This is an example, the red arrow is pointing to a Bank of America bond that this client has. Let's zoom in on that. It shows you the name of the company, right? I'm looking on the left side, it's a five and a quarter percent bond. You can also see that it matures in December 1st of 2015. BE means book entry, it means there's no certificate for this bond. DTD means it is dated, that's when it came out in 2003. It also shows you when the first coupon was paid. It tells you also the ratings. This is rated by Moody's, which is one of the big rating agencies, as BAA3, and S&P rates this bond triple B+. I'm not going to go through what all those rating means, but all bonds have some sort of rating, and it shows you that information here. The next column is quantity. It shows you that you have $30,000 worth of this bond. That means that if the bond, when the bond comes due, assuming that the company doesn't default, you will get $30,000 in principal plus, all of, plus your last interest payment. It pays interest. Let's scooch all the way to the right where it says estimated annual income. It's paying $1,575 a year. That, again, it's list, they use the word estimated annual income because it's not guaranteed, meaning the brokerage firm is not guaranteeing it. This is an estimate based on how the bond is supposed to perform. If for some reason the Bank of America has a problem or defaults, then it is possible that you would not get some of your income or possibly if the bond defaults, you might not get back all of your principal or any of your principal if there's a real, real bad situation. Other information that you can see here, let's look at the market value column. It shows you the bond is worth about $30,888. I like to tell people that's an estimate because bonds in particular, they don't trade quite as often as stocks do. So the price you see is possibly an estimate based on how similarly priced bonds have recently traded. So just because you see that price there, if you call up your advisor and say, sell my bond right now, he may not get exactly that price. Also, depending on the size of the bond and the market and the spreads, don't forget bonds normally trade with a spread. There's a bid and ask, which means that just like with currencies, if you trade currencies, normally they trade with a bid and ask. You pay the higher price, but if you sell it, you get the lower price. That spread is how all the traders make their money. Everyone involved in the transaction is making money on that spread. So the market value that you see here, if you decided to sell it, there would be some sort of markdown as part of the spread. Normally, I, I have to tell you, most of the clients, I would say almost in every case, every bond that the clients buy, not always, but almost every case, is held until maturity because clients like the predictability. This client knows that on December 1st of the year 2015, he is going to get $30,000 back from this bond. Okay, let's move on. The portfolio holdings continue. Here, this is a page with all of his stocks on it. And you can see very similar information. You can see the for each company, you can look at how much it costs him to buy it. That's called the cost basis, what the current market value is. Then there's the column, which is the unrealized gain or loss. That means that the value of the stock is either up or down since he bought it. It's unrealized because he hasn't sold it. Once he sells it, then it will become a realized gain or loss. And once it's sold, of course, it will no longer appear on his current monthly statement. And on the right, it's showing you the estimated yield, which is the dividend yield that they estimate the client is going to receive from these stocks. Here are a few more stocks on the bottom. Also, you can see a similar type of thing with mutual funds. You can see the mutual funds section represents 28% of his portfolio. He owns a few different mutual funds. In fact, he owns many different mutual funds. And it also shows you how much he paid for it, what the current market price is and the market value, whether there's a realized gain or loss, how much annual income he should get, and what that represents in terms of yield, meaning a dividend yield on those mutual funds. So in conclusion, if you're not going to look at the whole statement, I, I know I drilled down a lot and I hope you're still with me. 
if the, the important thing, the number one thing is pull the statement out of the envelope, look at the ending account value, make sure that it is in line with what you believe the it, it should be based on what you've heard the market's been doing and your spending and additions and subtractions from the account. And if ever you're not sure, you can drill down like I just showed you here. Or in any case, every time you're not sure about something, call your advisor. That's why we're here. We're here to help to answer all of the questions that you may have about your investments. Thanks very much and good luck.